Hey everyone, this is Johnny Cannis, and you're listening to Dennis and the Australian Rock Show across Australia and across the world. Yeah, hop. Hey everyone, it is Dennis Gray, and you are listening to show number 78 of the Australian Rock Show. Once again, it's good to have you on board, and thanks for taking the time to listen in. We really do appreciate it. Johnny Cannis needs no introduction. As vocalist for the Hitmen, Cannis has etched his name into Australian music history and then some, and his rock and roll story could fill a book. Away from the stage, he's filled several other roles, such as producing records by the Psychotic Turnbuckles, managing bands like the New Christs and Screaming Tribesmen, and as many of you will know, was MC and backup vocalist for Radio Birdman. With shows coming up in November alongside the Angels and Rose Tattoo, Cannis's high energy all on nothing approach to performing continues a career which now spans four decades and shows no signs of slowing down a couple of days back we got Zeus on the phone for a chat and looked over much of his career and indeed what is on the horizon for himself and hitmen dtk we'll get to that interview in a moment straight after a song turn this sucker up loud folks ship ahoy and bombs away here are the hitmen from 1982 with pay up or shut up Johnny Cannis, it's Dennis from the Australian Rock Show. How are you? Dennis from the Australian Rock Show. How are you going? Good, thanks. Good to chat with you tonight. And, mate, good news for all Hitmen fans is that the band are back together again with a a new Best Of album called Solid As A Rock and are also coming off a bunch of well-received shows in July in support of that album. And the momentum continues with shows booked in November with The Angels and also Rose Tattoo. How many years has it been since the Hitmen shared a bill with The Angels? Oh, wow. Um, lunch time we played with the Angels would have been 1982, 83, somewhere around there. No, 82, I'd say. 81, 82, 80, we were really just touring everywhere with them, mm-hmm. getting out to the suburbs. Uh, I remember I wore my white tails once. My white tux at Manly Flicks Theatre. Uh, I, I didn't know that Doc had bought himself a black tux <laughs> and, <laughs> and he came on straight after me in a black tux. It was just crazy. It was good, good times. They, they looked after us. The road crew always looked after us because we had uh, a crew of our, our, our own back then. Uh, we had three guys that used to help lug the equipment in, lug the equipment out. Um, I remember once we also did a show with Rose Tattoo back in the day. We got a phone call saying that Flowers, Ice House, Flowers had cancelled and if we asked if we wanted to play, it was $150, uh, supporting Rose Tattoo at, at Barabin. And we, we all lived in the city. It's about like 45 minutes to an hour hike. We got out there as quick as we could and then they uh, they said, uh, you had nobody to help us load in the equipment. <laughs> and we thought, oh, shit, you know, here's, here's a bit of trouble. Um, so they made us set our drum kit in front of their drum kit and wanted to charge us $60 before we played. Otherwise, we couldn't play. So we had to phone around and ask our fans to to come early. We'd put, put their name on the door and mm. they'd lend us some money some money so we could pay the road crew. <laughs> so they, they, were, they were not very good members of Rose Tattoo, but you know, we, we get on pretty well now. Well, before we get too far into the interview, I do wish to offer congratulations. We are closing in on four decades since the Hitman's formation and doing a bunch of shows with the Angels and the Tats is a great way to celebrate 40 years of solid rock action, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't think of it that way, but uh, I was actually um, uh, remembering a couple of shows we did back in uh, 78 uh, when Mazuak got back from Europe. Yeah, so that, yeah, it was 40 years ago. Well, I Good just mentioned. There, Dennis. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I just mentioned <laughs> there were shows in July on the Gold Coast. Some shows in Sydney, Brisbane, Northern New South Wales, also Adelaide and Melbourne. How did those shows go? Oh, they were crazy, wild, just incredible. The support band, the Pro Tools, uh, featuring Pete Howlett from the Blood Sucking Freaks, Andy from uh, the Exploding White Mice on bass. And, oh, geez, the, the boys just really got the crowd warmed up for us. And we were, you know, we were just a little bit nervous. Tony had big shoes to fill um, on lead guitar. Uh, Vince was our new guitarist, but it really just clicked. I knew it was going to click just going by the rehearsals. 
Mm. And well, you know, I, I went into it very, very confident and, um, you know, had total confidence in the whole show being a knockout. And it was, it was just, uh, the only thing, as I said earlier, is, is I was, I had the flu, uh, I had to battle through that, but you know, we got really good reviews from it. You know, um, we were really happy with the response. The crowds were awesome. Really, really good. It's disappointing we couldn't get to a lot of the areas, but we'll probably tackle that in the new year when we release our mini album, which we've just finished recording. Good stuff. Well, we kicked off this show with the stomping Pay Up or Shut Up. Lifted, as many of our listeners will know, off the 1982 Hitman album, It Is What It Is. RCA had paired the band with Bruce Brown and Russell Dunlop to produce that record. What are your memories of that time period and indeed recording that track? Well, I just remember that we were trying to get Ron Ashton out here and we negotiated a fee for Ronald to come out here and um, stay with us and produce the album for us. But, you know, RCA, B&G, and our management for that matter, didn't know who he was. <laughs> we're trying to, you know, trying to explain, you know, mm. who he was to a bunch of guys, guys that just come off recording, we're sorry, producing uh, the real, the metal as anything. And we were told, if you want an album, you've got to use these guys. Otherwise, there's no album. We'd only just signed a BMG. Uh, so we sort of like had to cop it on the chin. The studio recording uh, was okay, but we were like, you know, kept away from each other. It wasn't like a group thing. Hmm. When I did my vocals, for example, nobody was allowed in the in the studio except for the two producers and me. And, um, you know, when you record... Uh, the rhythm tracks, for example, you've got to put on a guide vocal and just to let everybody know where they are situated in the song, especially the rhythm section. And at the end, during the mixing, nobody, again, was allowed in the studio during the mixing. They mixed it on their own. They used my guide tracks, my vocal guide tracks as some of the lead vocals. Mm. And it wasn't until I think, I think you know, to, um, Six, seven years later when Mazowak got his hands on the original masters and re, re, um, remixed them uh, and found the real vocals and put them on. So it wasn't a really happy time recording because Brad had the, had the shits, you know, with Chris uh, over that period of time. And it was like a bit of a di- dictatorship, he felt. And... Um, didn't like the process of the recording, you know, and and the way it was structured um, and lost all faith in the hitman and went on to join the Hoodoo Gurus during that that whole thing. The band were looking at relocating to Canada around that time too, I believe. In hindsight, do you think that that move would have been beneficial? Yeah, it would have have been different, eh? It would have been Mm. a little bit different, but uh, um, I just picked up guitar when Brad left. And I was really enjoying it. The songs were sounding different. I don't think we were writing new songs. I think we were just sort of like having playing different versions of them and they were just, uh, you know, being appreciated live. People were still going nuts, still the mm. same songs. Um, but traveling overseas would have been, a, you know, maybe we could have picked up a different guitarist over in Canada. We we're going to stay with Chris's dad. Um, and that, those plans went out the window when I had that car accident. Mm. Uh, but, you know, we were all looking forward to it. You know, it would have been great, I think. Uh, you know, obviously a new batch of songs would have come out of Canada. Uh, who knows where it would, would, would have taken us, but, you know, that shit happens, eh? On the way to a gig, I had a car accident. I guess, do you want to explain that? I guess we've got a lot of uh, younger listeners who wouldn't be aware of, uh, you know, that incident. Well, we were having a break, a well-deserved break, <laughs> and... Um, Rob had been invited to support um, Iggy Pop on his Australian tour beneath the band. Mm. So he borrowed the Hitman, in inverted commas, borrowed, <laughs> right? <laughs> and um, I thought, well, I'm not going to sit around and, and do nothing. So I put a soul band together uh, with uh, the backing band being uh, Rowan Cannon from Rupert B, Mick Thornton, Mick Buckley from Rupert B, uh, Don Raphael, it's basically the whole Rupert B band and Chris Mazowak's girlfriend uh, on keyboards, mm. sorry, on keyboards, on, on lead vocals, on keyboards with Stevie Harris from The Passengers, played on all the Sunny Boys albums. 
and was the bass player in The Visitors. Uh, and later on, Johnny Cannon's Explosion. So we put a soul review together and uh, we were touring at the same time as what Iggy Pop and the New Christ were uh, performing at the same time. And uh, on the way to a show, Cornwall Leagues Club, I remember paying the toll at the toll gate there at Waterfall. I caught a drunk driver on the freeway. Mm. We had a, had a head on head on car crash. I was hospitalised for about three to four months. It was pretty bad. Band broke up. Rob kept the band and um, kept the band going. When I came out of hospital, I recovered enough to. I tried to attend my benefit concert, but I couldn't get to it. But uh, later on, when I got better, I started managing the New Christ which was uh, a good thing because during the whole Hitman early lifetime, I was managing the band as well, doing all the all the paperwork and negotiating with agents and venues mm. and things like that. Mm. So it was, uh, it was a good little um, experience for me managing the new Christ. It was uh, a little bit different, dealing with Rob all the time, but, you know, it was good. <laughs> it was a good experience. Everyone you, had fun. Uh, you mentioned earlier on, about writing and recording new material. So we are likely to see new Hitman material soon? Well, yeah, yeah. We're writing. We're still writing now. Um, we've got a three-album uh, plan together, running over a three-year period. Uh, I can't really say too much now, but um, I'm, I promise I'll give you the inside information when it gets a little bit closer. It's just there's a, there's a, there's a little strategy we're putting together. My brother Sammy, Sammy K, Sammy Canis, who owns uh, Alchemy Music Group Recording Studios, has produced six tracks for us. Mm. Uh, and, and they sound just incredible. That's with Vince Cascuna. And I'll let the cat out of the bag. He's the grand wizard from the Psychotic Turn Ruckles. And, um, yeah, Tony Jukic, Murray Shepard, Brad Shepard's brother on drums, and Tony, original bass player, who took over from Warren Gilbert in the early days. Uh, Tony Robinson is on bass. Yes, yeah, really, just really powerful guitars. The drawing's amazing. Great songs. Uh, and we're going to be touring March, April next year again mm. uh, on the back of that. So we've got a new lease of life. And equally good news for all Hitman fans is that the band's entire catalogue is now available in digital form via Laneway Music. And this includes stuff like early demos and studio stuff that was previously not commercially available. Yeah, that's right. We actually, um, for some reason, I don't know why, um, David Lang, from who was with uh, Shock Records, who owned Savage Beat, put the albums out through Shock, 207, 208, 209, 210. Uh, so we, it's basically what he released is available now through digital outlets. Mm. Uh, he's the one that compiled the whole thing. So David Lang really should take all the credit for, for um, these releases. Uh, however... Also, a big credit goes out to Vince Donato, ex-vice president of Mushroom Records, who's formed Laneway Music with um, with Dan. Um, and, uh, you know, thanks to them, you know, you, you can access all the Hitman tunes now worldwide very quickly. It's I think, hip- sorry, mate, and all the listeners can access sorry. the entire Hitman catalogue through iTunes and Spotify as well, correct? That's correct, yeah. And a lot of, like you said, a lot of rarities which were put together originally uh, for re-releases by David Lang. So, folks, after this uh, episode, you know what to do. Yeah, just um, search Hitman or Hitman DTK. Um, if you know the names of the albums, um, or type in a song. <laughs> I'm sure it'll pop up somewhere. <laughs> Everything's out there. Now, I suppose I need to ask the obvious question. This current lineup of the Hitman does not include Chris Mazowak with his spot being filled, as you said, by Vince Cascuna. Do you want to explain to the listeners why Klondike is not there? Well, we it's not he he wasn't sacked or anything. It was just um an unfortunate thing, you know, he lives in Spain. You know, we live in Australia. Mm. We over over a three year period we made him several offers to tour. The last one he kinda like uh struggled with I mean we're not like the biggest earning band in, in the world uh, and then when he introduced his manager uh, things got really crazy mm. uh, they were demanding much more than we could afford to pay um, you know of course we were going to cover his all his accommodation and airfares and, and, a, and a, a nice fee to play with us 
play with his own band, basically, but uh, it just wasn't enough. And unfortunately, the distance really killed it. Um, and we couldn't meet a deadline. And we were told by the agency, the Harbour Agency, strike three, which means the third cancellation, and we will dump you, basically. And I couldn't have that. And we just had a band meeting and thought, you know, just give Chris a deadline. And so we gave Chris the deadline where we had to get back to the agency and he and his manager uh, didn't get back to us in time and uh, we just had to just put the plan B into action, which was, um, you know, uh, trialing out a new guitarist and it seemed to work right from the very beginning. And we copped it from all areas because his manager owns a website that is... Um, quite influential in the alternative sort of indie scene. Uh, but, you know, we, we kept our heads up high and uh, we kind of like went to and fro with uh, verbal insults for a while there and that became ridiculous and it all stopped. But, you know, like, he's always welcome back, you know. But as I said, he lives in Spain. I know you and Chris go way back bandmates uh, from memory in an outfit called the Jackals, circa 74, 75, and in many ways true rock and roll blood brothers has the recent tension between yourselves been hard to deal with yeah extremely hard um it just we went to high school together <laughs> you know um it's unfortunate that he got his manager involved because as soon as his manager got involved things just went haywire um i'm not going to mention any names but you know most people know who he is it was a very difficult communication uh, for about a, a month in particular and everybody just turned on each other and it was just, you know, it's quite sad the way it ended up. But now we're all kind of like happy that we've got the band in, in its format the way it is. I'm still an original, you know. I'm still the voice, I guess. So they, we are playing Chris's songs. Uh, we're playing them really good, uh, the best we can play them and we're getting good reactions and... Um, uh, Tony Robertson's the original bass player and the other guys, you know, there's a small degree of difference there, isn't it? I mean, Murray Shepard, Brad Shepard's brother. <laughs> Tony Dukic was with um, the Johnny Cannis band from 1985. I've been playing with him for, you worked that out, what's that, 32 years. And uh, Vince was, in fact, I asked Vince, I said, well, why why do you want to try out for the band? He says, because I'm a fan. <laughs> so that was good <laughs> enough reason to, mm. uh, good enough reason. Says, Plus I know the songs and, um, you know, we're less pop now than what we uh, were with Chris. Uh, it's pretty hard now, pretty pretty heavy kind of sound. From the viewpoint of being a long-time supporter of both you guys uh, for a long, long time, I personally hope that fences can be mended and at one time uh, in the future you can both share the same stage again in the future. Just that I'd put that out there. Yeah, well, thanks, mate. I, I, I hope so too. Uh, but we would never be done under negotiation with his manager. Okay, so um, Vince Cascuna is a very solid player and way underrated for people who aren't aware. As you mentioned, guitarist Vince has... Recently been playing in uh, Buffalo Revisited, but was also in Sheik the Shake, the Psychotic Turnbuckles, of course, uh, the Conspirators, others I now forget. So I encourage listeners to dig into Vince's musical past as well. I, uh, of course, love the Turnbuckles, a band, of course, whom you managed for a, a time, didn't you? Yeah, I did, actually. Yeah, I, um, I managed them from 1984, 85 right through to 1992, 93. So there's quite a few good albums there. And I think I produced one of them, didn't I? Sarah's of the Far Out. Indeed you did, and what a great album. So what can people expect to hear in the set? Any deep cuts? Yeah, we, um, we've we pressed the reset button and gone back to... Um, we're going to be playing a Sex Pistols song, believe it or not. We're playing cool. a Bring Broader Dictators song in. A couple of new originals. Uh, we've got a Clash song. We're even doing a Ramon song. Plus songs off the first album, second album, and Tora Tora DTK. We don't play much of Moronic Inferno, which is the album we recorded in Texas. 
Are you playing King of the Surf? I've always yeah. really loved that tune. What the hell? Why don't we crank King of the Surf right here and now? Turn it up, folks, because we're going to have a surfing party tonight. Originally released back in 1977 on the RCA label, reissued back in 1991 via Dave Lang's Dogmeat label and sounding better than ever, that was, of course. Johnny Cannis ripping through the trash man's King of the Surf. From memory, it was included on that Do the Pop compilation as well, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. David Lang put that together. Uh, did you know more about me than I know about me? <laughs> 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 You've got a good memory. Oh, well, you historian good on you uh, i'm really uh, glad to be having this chat with you um yeah dennis tech produced it and it features charlie georgie's on guitar from the hellcats uh, who was you know in the lead singer being ron pina um who else played on it um basically radio blue man minus rob it, it was a, a good time for me because it was just after i sang on radios appear with them as well Here's a tough one. Can you single out your favourite couple of Hitman songs to play live and why? Um, didn't tell the man uh, because it was our first single. And I remember our countdown appearance was quite surreal. Uh, it featured uh, Daryl Braithwaite, who had just come back from touring with... Uh, Sherbet in America, where they changed, they came back, changed their name to Highway and All Brew Beards, and it was uh, we were introduced by him and Molly Melvin without a hat, um, and it was <laughs> yeah, and it was quite quite an amazing, fun experience uh, doing that countdown show. But it was also um, didn't tell a man um, was, was a song that Radio Birdman had recorded during the Rockville studio, uh, Living Eyes. Um, uh, a recording session over in Wales, and they didn't use it, so we use it. Um, yeah, that, that that would be one I'd really like to hear again. Uh, and it's so hard from Tora Tora DTK, which is a song mm. we still play now, and it was a song that uh, I co-wrote. Um, well, I wrote the music, and the lyrics were written by Ronnie Pino and Tony Robinson. In fact, the same lyrics uh, for the 31st, uh, which features Tony Robertson and Ron Pino uh, for a song that they called it so hard as well. So we mm. basically borrowed those lyrics and adapted them to new music. Uh, the 31st actually have an EP out now, which I've released through Zeus Entertainment Group, through Laneway. Yeah, so those okay, two songs, so- I can keep, keep going if you want. No, that's all right. But, mate, I do want to keep today's interview contemporary. Uh, I also want to ask you a couple of things from the past, which we've dug into. Now, of all the Hitman material, which you just mentioned before, I always thought the Moronic Inferno album was in more ways than one underappreciated, should have been more successful than it was, particularly internationally. I mean, there's material on that album that is every bit bit as good as classic Hitman tunes from the late 70s, early 80s, stuff like St. Valentine's Day, Too Many Girls, Pop's All Gone, as a Hitman fan, I had high hopes for the success of Moronic Inferno when it was released. It's a solid record. How well did the album do? Well, thanks for saying that. We thought it was going to go so well that um, I moved to America with my family, packed the bags. My wife's American, so I had a green card. Mm. Uh, my ex-wife. And um, I tried to get a deal over there. Um and it was pretty tough being the manager and the singer of the band trying to get a deal in America. It wasn't very well appreciated by labels, uh, maybe thinking we were a bit long in the tooth at the time. But, yeah, look, it's really strange and interesting at the same time how that whole album came together. You might remember that Chris Mazowak was in The Screaming Tribesman, um, and he'd written 99% of that album for the Streaming Tribesman. It was going to be their second album right. in America and, and Australia. So he, he and um, uh, Mick had already record, uh, put together the songwriting uh, and demos for that uh, new second Streaming Tribesman album. But it didn't eventuate. Um, they broke up and he brought those songs to the Hitmen. For me, it wasn't as comfortable recording that as what it was singing and performing on that first album of ours. 
uh, a little bit different. Like those those melodies and lyrics and um, uh, arrangements were written for Mick Madu, not for Johnny Countess. If you kind of get what I mean, and, um, and that's not the reason why it didn't sell well. But uh, we did get a deal through Shock Records. Uh, David Williams, the owner at the time of Shock Records back then, loved it. Um, he put it out. You know, he sold a few thousand copies. Didn't do anything overseas. Although we did have a production deal with uh, Sugar Hill Studios in Texas, where we recorded the album. That's the home of the Big Bopper, and I think the Rolling Stones recorded some tracks there as well. Andy Bradley, the Radio Birdman tour manager uh, from back in the day, had moved to America. He was the chief engineer at the studio, so we struck a deal with him. We paid our own way to get out of there. We invited Dennis Tech, who lived in Billings, Montana, to come down and record and play with us, play harmonica, sing backups, play guitar on some tracks, which he did. Um, and then it was up to me to come back and sell it, and I couldn't do it. Couldn't get a major deal in Australia, so as I said, I went to America and uh, nothing happened there, and that's when Shock picked it up. Around about the same time that Dark Carnival were going to come out here and do a tour. Well, it was a funny time for music, you know, 1991, with the music landscape, as I've mentioned before, and many others have, shifting away from, you know, what was going on locally and, and, and hard rock and, and rock and roll and all eyes on Seattle. Yeah, 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 that's right, uh, Seattle. I, rem- I remember I was... Um, doing a little bit of work with the Harbour Agency at the time. And, um, yeah, Nirvana were in Australia. Same period of time, I think. I, I just got back from America. And uh, they were playing at the Phoenician Club. And they were, I think Kurt was in hospital from uh, taking a, a few too many, whatever it was he put in his system. And, uh, yeah, so Seattle was really starting to take over with Paul Jam and uh, Nirvana and what have you. The live scene was also on its way out as, as well, don't forget, you know. Um, the pub rock days were starting to fade, so it mm. wasn't really good for live touring bands like us. Now, a while back there was a new Johnny Cannon single released, a cover of the Elvis tune, Edge of Reality, which originally appeared oh, right. in Elvis's final film, Live a Little, Love a Little, which also had the great Elvis tune, A Little Less Conversation. Was that one of your favourite yeah. Elvis movies? What are, you, what are your what are your favourite Elvis tunes? My favourite tune has to be Viva Las Vegas because mm. uh, I was a little kid. My mum used to buy all the Elvis records. Uh, but yeah, look, um, I, I love that song, and I I think we played it in the Johnny Cannon's Explosion in the mid eighties, mm. and always wanted to do a, kind of like a modern version. After I heard a little bit more conversation, uh, I thought we could do a really good job with Edge of Reality. So we did. We got it to a stage where um, um, we were ready to mix it, and I thought, why don't we get our mate Jimmy on it? So I just asked him. I bumped into him at a concert up here in Queensland, and uh, he said, yeah, for old time's sake. So we actually recorded two songs, Ring of Fire and uh, Edge of Reality with Jimmy. So they're both. Okay, I was going to ask that. So, kind of so, of course, Edge of Reality also features Jimmy Barnes on vocals. So just those two tracks, two tracks on that session? Yeah, just the two tracks. Took us uh, <laughs> took us three years. When uh, we recorded in 2013 and released it in 2015, took us two years to mix it. <laughs> it was really a long process. We were just in between trying to work out what to do with the Hitmen and what to do with the Johnny Cannon's explosion and Maswak being mm. overseas. It was wasn't a very good time actually. What are your other uh, business activities that are keeping you busy? Uh, any management projects? I know that you were involved with Love Child, great Sydney band a while back. Yeah, I was involved with them for a while back, but uh, we've moved on. Uh, mm-hmm. They're doing their own thing now. Uh, that was a good good time. Um, I manage a young girl called Yana Nicholas, who my brother Sammy had just produced in his studio at Alchemy. She's just recorded a, a brand new album. She's a 19-year-old. Like she, she's a cross between uh, Susie DiMarchi, um, Pat Benatar meets Chrissy Amphlett. Wow. So, uh, so has she got... Has she got, got, yeah, uh, got a, so what does she have released? She's, she's got a song called Dozens of Hearts, which is out now through iTunes. Um, okay. It's Y-I-A-N-N-A, Nicholas, as it sounds. And right. it's, it's up through Lane, Zeus Laneway. 
channeled and uh, her new album is 13 songs we've just recorded so I'm just working out um, putting a band together for her. Oh, nice. What else? I'm just about to, re- about, just about to release the uh, Love Grinders album which features uh, Tony Robinson on bass and David Slade. It's just about three, four weeks away. Yeah, yeah, and I've just, as I said earlier, I've released the 31st, uh, which features Mick Maju, uh Screaming Tribesman, Ronnie Pino, Die Pretty, Tony Robinson, and Chris Wells from Die Pretty as well. It was their very first band. Uh, back in the late 70s uh, in Brisbane, when, you know, the scene was uh, ruled by Joe Bialki and the Coppers. Um, so, so that's that's doing really well, actually. Uh, pity there's no band to to put on the road, but uh, we know how busy Die Pretty have been lately. Uh, so there's a few other things I'm doing, but um, mainly ever, just focused on Yarn and Nicholas and Hitman. You ever thought about um, putting your history down in a book? Yeah. <laughs> There's a bit of a story to tell. Uh, biography, you mean? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I've got some ideas. I'm actually Good. starting to write now. Well, thanks, man. I do um, have some things I haven't shared on radio or television before in interviews and paper. You know, back from the early days of my very first records and mm. what I grew up with, the high school, high school days. So you have been on the Australian music scene for a, a long time now. In all that time, mate, is there one Australian band who stands out in your mind who you thought should have made it big but didn't? Maybe the Screaming Tribesmen? Um, well, when I first... Well, Birdman, Birdman, Radio Birdman is big now, but the very first thing I said to Rob Younger when I saw Radio Birdman live, I looked, I looked at him, shook his hand, I was just in awe of him. Uh, I said, you guys are better than the Rolling Stones. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I thought um, Screaming Trisden, uh had the songs. Back of the Vampire, when I was managing them, was signed to, was taken off. I took it off Citadel Records because I thought, you know, well, it, the songs just needs national, international exposure, needs a video mm. clip, you know, need, needs needs to be uh, on radio, basically. And um, I took it from Citadel, gave it to CBS Records. That song should have been huge in the 80s. It um, should have, should have uh, you know, just been big all over the world. And I thought that was one chance gone by the wayside. Um, but then when they released uh, Bones and Flowers, I really think we had a shot at it in America. Mm. We had the number one single in Los Angeles at the same time as which all of mine was number six in LA. Uh, we were number one. Uh, Rodney Bingenheimer was right behind it. It was the number one college album, number one college single. We were signed to Ryko Disc, who, you know, uh, was their first big band, major band signing, I guess, because they were really majored in uh, releasing eclectic reissues of, like, the, the whole Jimi Hendrix catalogue, the whole David, David Bowie catalogue. Uh, huge. Uh, and they were going to sink money into it, and that's around the same time as the band broke up. But I saw light at the end of the tunnel, you know, with the, with those guys over there, and uh, you know. But I guess I'm I'm also meaning I don't know. You walked into a club somewhere I don't know, and uh, you just thought they're going to be they're going to be massive. Well, in excess were massive, but when they supported us on a Wednesday night residency back in 19. 19- 78, 79, at the Bondi Lifesaver. I looked with one of my roadies sitting side stage by the bar there, looking at them and saying, well, oh, these guys are going to be big one day. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know, and they don't get paid like $150 to support the hitman. Uh, I knew in my blood, just I could just sense that they were going to be huge, that, and they were. That did, did become huge. As for somebody missing the boat, um, I really can't get my head around it right now. That's all right. As many of our listeners will know, there's been a recent movie about Radio Birdman called Descent into the Maelstrom. Much is made of Birdman's legacy, and rightly so. Yet, objectively, do you think enough is done to preserve the legacy of other equally significant Australian bands, including the Hitmen? Uh, yeah, I think so. We were the very first band to shoot off from Radio Birdman. We are the very first 
offshoot of Birdman to get into the suburbs of Australia. Mm. Um, we were um, one of the first to be signed to a major label. Um, look, you know, I'm happy with the way it turned out for the Hitmen. Unfortunately, the record companies really didn't know what to do with us. You know, were we ahead of our times? I don't know. People say that, but we, I don't think we were. It's just it was really heavy, really confusing for them to be listening and, and to a bunch of uh, guys that were influenced by Detroit, you know, um, mm. the MC5, Iggy Pop and the Stooges, the Ramones to a certain degree, the Sex Pistols, Flaming Groovies. They just didn't know what to do with us. They didn't know how, how to market us. We were signed to a label who had Cold Chisel, you know, um, mm. uh, the Pretenders, the Radiators, you know, all the Aussie rock back mm, in the mm. late 70s which was sort of creeping up and becoming really big. I mean, we should have been on that Australian-made concert. Why not? You know, the Saints got on it. Look, I, I'm, I'm happy. I've got no issues anywhere, really. Um, we had our break. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we didn't have the dollars backing behind us that most of these other bands did. Uh, as for Radio Birdman, they had to die and go away for a long time for, for their legacy, uh, you know. <laughs> Uh, how long were they broken up for? Uh, the, the reunion was 95 or 96, I think. 96. So 17 years, 18 mm. years later. Mm. Uh, you know, the big, big gap between gigs, but it took 18 years for the next generation to come through and get a hand on the music, and the music was all, has always been available. The Hitman music just disappeared. It wasn't available. Well, as we've uh, yeah. mentioned, all the Hitman albums, as well as a bunch of uh, live material, demos, radio stuff, etc., has been digitally redone and is available via iTunes. So go to Laneway Music for that. Hitman DTK with the Angels and Rose Tattoo, 24th of November at Penrith Panthers and Waves at Wollongong the following night, which is Saturday the 25th of November. Go to hitmendtk.com for more information. Zeus, every guest on the show gets to select a song by an Australian band that has a special meaning for you. It can be one of yours. Is there something you'd like to choose and why? New Race by Radio Birdman. I have to say that is the song because I put that white tux on when I was 16 years old. Who would have guessed like years later, it's still, I'm still getting kind of fan mail from that film clip. Uh, I'm still getting people recognising you know, my part and all that um, had led me to King of the Surf. So, yeah, new race by Radio Birdman. Yeah, up. Johnny Cannis, thanks for coming on the show tonight. Wonderful to talk with you. Must get you on again soon to dig more into your amazing musical history. Thanks for having me, mate.